and with you. May we be so when we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Well, for the last month, we've been examining the journey of Jesus to the cross. We saw his agony in the garden. We saw his betrayal and his arrest. We saw him being abandoned by his disciples. We saw the accusations that were brought against him. And then on Friday, Pastor Kirk preached and we remembered his death on the cross. We've called this journey Rugged Redemption. And I want to go back and remind us of Friday before we move forward into the joy of today. When Jesus was crucified, there was a criminal on his left and there was a criminal on his right. Mark chapter number 15 verse 25 says that Jesus' crucifixion began at the third hour of the day. According to Jewish, uh, the way that they kept time, the first hour of the day was 6 a.m. The third hour of the day would be 9 a.m. says that he was crucified at the third hour. If we continue and go ahead, if you have your Bible, to turn with me to Mark chapter number 15. We'll be in a number of different spots today. Mark chapter 15, and if you look with me to verses 29 through 32, says this, Those who passed by hurled insults at Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they mocked him among themselves, saying, He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Luke chapter 23 verse 36 says that the soldiers, they came and they mocked him as well. We had four different groups of people all either hurling insults at him or mocking him. Those who passed by did that. Those who were the religious leaders of the time, they insulted him and mocked him. Those who were on his left, the one who was on his left and the one who was on his right, they mocked him as well. And then the soldiers who were part of putting him on the cross and those who were there standing guard, they mocked him as well. The Bible doesn't tell us how long the insults continued, but my guess is that they didn't stop. And as it approached noon, after three hours beside Jesus, one of the criminals said to him, and this is Luke chapter 23, verse 42. After three hours beside Jesus, one of the criminals said this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Something happened in those three hours. Being with Jesus makes a difference. A man who started the morning bitter and hurling insults at Jesus come to, comes to see him as his only hope. A man who is about to die without hope is divinely hanging beside the hope of the world. We sometimes fall into the trap of believing that what's written about an event in the Bible is all that took place. You've heard of the seven, seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And I happen to believe that Jesus said much more than those seven things. How did this criminal know about Jesus' kingdom? Probably because as Jesus hung there, he shared the truth of his kingdom with him. How did he know that Jesus, this one who was in the middle, how did he know that he was the one that had the power to save his eternal soul? Probably because of what Jesus had said to him in those three hours. I believe that Jesus took those three hours on the cross to do what he had done in his earthly ministry. And that is to minister to a bitter, hopeless, and helpless man. Honestly, I believe he ministered to both of them. But one was receptive and one was not. That bitter, hopeless, and helpless man in those three hours became a child of God. Luke 23, verse 43, we just read verse 42, is a very familiar verse where Jesus responds to this criminal. 
The one who had said, remember me when, when, you, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says these words, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. In the span of three hours, this man's eternity was changed. And I'm not going to keep you here for three hours this morning. No amen? <laughs> Maybe I will. <laughs> I guess if you stay for the second service, you could be here for three hours for sure. But in the span of three hours, this man's eternity was changed, and you're going to be here just a little over an hour. And I don't know what's in your heart as you arrive here this morning. I don't know if you are a bit bitter about your circumstances. I don't know if you are angry at God. I don't know if you've been doubting his existence. I don't know what your situation is, but here's what I know. If you spend time with Jesus, he'll change your life. Amen. This thief who, it says, scripture says, the soldiers mocked him, the religious leaders mocked him, those who passed by mocked him, and it says, and those who were crucified with him heaped insults upon him. He began that day at 9 o'clock a.m., making fun of Jesus, probably thinking it was ridiculous that this man was hanging there on the cross. He must have done something terrible too. And within three hours, his eternity was changed. If you came in bitter, Jesus is for you. If you came in hopeless, Jesus is for you. If you came in helpless, I want you to know that Jesus is for you. Came in confused, he's for you. Empty, definitely for you. Angry, Jesus will meet you right where you are. There's so much beautiful th theology in what we can learn from Jesus just saying, today you will be with me in paradise. He's teaching what is also taught by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. And there we find that for a Christian to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with, with the Lord. And Jesus says to this man, this thief on the cross, when he said, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. This isn't going to be the end. This isn't, as some people believe, you don't just live your life on this earth and then cease to exist. If so, then Jesus is a liar and I think all of us understand that Jesus is no liar. He refutes those who would teach that following life on this earth, we simply cease to exist. No, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. You need to know this morning that you won't cease to exist either when you die. You will live forever, either you're eternally with Jesus or eternally separated from him. Heaven and hell are both very real places. In a span of three hours, this criminal went from being on his way to hell to being promised an eternity in heaven. That is, that is beautiful. That is wonderful. And why? It's because he met Jesus. Here at North Winds, we are not about religious performance. We are about introducing people to Jesus so that they can live in relationship with him through the course of this life, and for all eternity. Some of you may have grown up in what I would call religious institutions, where you were expected to do certain things in order to be quote-unquote religious. I need to just shoot straight with you. There are a lot of religious people. They would have been included with those who were hurling insults at Jesus. There were a lot of religious people back then who died and went to hell. And there are a lot of religious people who will spend a lot of their time in various churches. They will spend a lot of their time doing a lot of religious things. And they will die and be separated from Jesus for all of eternity. Why? Because they don't have a relationship with him. How do you begin a relationship with Jesus? You do so through the prayer of faith. If you've never had a time in your life when you bowed your head before an almighty God and said, Jesus, I need you to rescue me from my sin. My sin is separating me from you. Please, Jesus, save me. It doesn't need to be those exact words, 
but it is, a, it is the prayer of faith that is necessary for the salvation of anyone in this life. If you go back to Luke chapter 23 again, following the conversion of the thief on the cross, we find this in verses 44 through 45. It says, it was now about the sixth hour. And that's where I say the three hours that changed his eternity. The crucifixion began at the third hour. It's now the sixth hour. So it's about noon. It's about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. For three hours there was darkness. For three hours the sun stopped shining. Now I know we are, we're what, a week and a day from the total eclipse of the sun, right? Uh, I don't know how excited you are about that, but we are a little over a week away, and you're going to get to see that, depending upon where you are, for approximately three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. There are some who, when they look at this, they say, okay, well, there must have been a solar eclipse, and that's what happened. I become curious about these things, so I decided to research what the longest ever solar total eclipse was and the longest one on record was seven minutes and 28 seconds on june the 15th of 743 bc okay so the longest recorded total solar eclipse was seven minutes it was dark the sun stopped shining for three hours now they say that on july the 16th and i don't know how they figure these things out they say that on July the 16th, 2186, there will be a total eclipse that is longer than that 7 minutes and 28 seconds from June the 15th, 743 B.C. And you know how much longer it's going to be? 1.2 seconds longer. It's going to last 7 minutes and 29 seconds. 29.2 seconds, they say. Again, I have no idea. How they, how they figure these things out. Here's what I do know. Three hours is a lot longer than seven minutes and 28 or 29 seconds. Here's the reality. God stopped the sun from shining. By his divine word, the sun started shining back at creation. And by his divine word, he stopped it from shining for three hours. I think to allow people to understand the gravity of what was taking place. That Jesus was taking upon himself the weight of the sin of all mankind. The very next verse says this in Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last or he breathed his last breath. Matthew 27, 50 says that Jesus gave up his spirit. Then in verse 50, verses 51 through 53, we find this. Again, I flip back to Matthew 27 at this point. It says this, at that moment, and this is the moment where Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and he breathed his last breath. It's at that moment it says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. I want to make sure you hear this. Are you hearing what is happening? Because some people like to avoid these verses because they sound crazy. Wait a second. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Yes, that's what happened. It says they came out of their tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and they appeared to many people. Again, they're often shied away from because they state a miraculous event and then quite frankly, just move on. No more explanation given as to what these people who came out of the tombs did. This happened? Period. Believe it. And there were so many people who got to see it because these people went into Jerusalem. It's not as if it was a hidden thing. And that's what you need to understand. The resurrection of Jesus is a historically documented event, not just in the Bible, but elsewhere. 
To deny the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus is to deny history. It's amazing what Jesus did and what God accomplished so that people would know, this is my son. In him I am well pleased. He's dying for the salvation of the entire world. Here's what we should see from Jesus' death on the cross. Those, I think this is so cool, those in the past were affected by his death because those who had already died were brought out of the tombs. Not everyone, just many people. So those from the past were affected by his death. Those from the present were affected by his death, right? Because the thief on the cross said, remember me. And he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then we know that everyone in the future is also affected by the death of Jesus Christ. Every person who would live thereafter, including you, including me, we're affected by the death of Jesus Christ. Now here's the thing. The holy people who were raised to life, they were saved by faith. The thief on the cross, saved by faith. And the only way any person throughout history has been or will be saved, rescued from their sin is through faith in Jesus. So I have to ask you this question. Have you ever trusted in Jesus as your Savior? Have you ever acknowledged the truth of Scripture, which is this, your sin separates you from God? Go all the way back to the beginning with Adam and Eve. When they rebelled against God, that rebellion brought sin into the world. And from that point forward, sinful man and a holy God have been separated except that through the blood of Jesus, they can be brought together. They can be reconciled. And if you haven't been reconciled with God, I plead with you this very morning to understand the weight of your sin, to understand the gravity of that, to understand that you will forever be separated from God, from Jesus, in a place called hell, a place of eternal torment. Now, the thing is this, hell was created for the devil and his angels. It's not God's desire that anyone go there. That's why he made a way for everyone to have salvation through his son. Yet some people reject that free gift. And you might be here this morning, again, having been bitter, maybe having even said things about God or Jesus in, in in a crowd of people or maybe just by yourself. I don't want anything to do with God. I think this religious stuff, I think this stuff about Jesus is a bunch of hogwash. Maybe you used a little bit more colorful language. It's not really appropriate for me to do that from up here. But maybe you had that in your mind or you said it out loud. I want you to know that Jesus is still for you. He wants to bring you into a relationship. The only way that The only way that happens is by you calling out in faith and saying, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died for my sin. I believe you paid my penalty. I believe you took my place. Will you please rescue me now? I challenge you, encourage you to do that. When Jesus died on the cross, he accomplished many significant things. Here's just a few. He took our guilt and our sin upon himself. If you were using a theological term, you would call this expiation. I'm not going to ask you to remember that. Just understand he took our sin and our guilt upon himself. In addition to that, he took our rightful punishment, not just our guilt and not just our sin, but the punishment for those things. The theological term for that would be propitiation. So you have expiation and propitiation. Again, you don't need to remember those things. I just want you to understand Jesus paid it all. On the cross of Calvary. And then he made a way for sinful man to be reconciled to a holy God. He also took away what was probably Satan's favorite weapon. Death. He took away the power of death. I was having a conversation with someone recently and we were talking about death. I said, here's the thing. I've come really close to dying. And I enjoy living on this earth, but when my time comes, I'm ready to be with Jesus. His blood has already been applied to my account. 
I am right with God. And when the last breath that I draw on this earth is taken, I know I will be ushered into the presence of Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know that the Lord has said to me through his word, the same as he has said to the, to the thief on the cross, you will be with me for all of eternity. And I'm excited about that. The power of death lives no longer in the life of a Christian. It just doesn't. I like what Matt Perman said. He said that Satan's only weapon that can ultimately hurt people is unforgiven sin. Satan's only weapon that can ultimately hurt people is unforgiven sin. And here's the thing. He can't make you reject Jesus. But oh, he likes to bring many things into your life. He likes to bring the doubts into your mind. He likes to, to bring the distractions. But I want you to know this. You're here this morning. And I know the power of the Holy Spirit is here this morning to convict your heart, to draw you to Jesus, to take you out of your sin. And in the course of an hour, it didn't, maybe not the three hours that it took the thief on the cross, but in the course of an hour, your eternity can forever be changed. Mine was changed many years ago. I look around and I know the stories of many of you and your eternity was changed many years ago. But I know that there are many likely in this room whose eternity has not yet been changed. But it needs to be changed. You need to trust in Jesus and his death on the cross as the only payment for your sins. Every child of God, when you die, you begin to live eternally. What a beautiful and a wonderful thing. And speaking of living eternally, we're obviously here this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. I know we look back at his death here just for a few moments, but we're here to celebrate his resurrection. He died in our place, was laid in the tomb, and then the end of Matthew 27 describes his burial. It even describes the way in which the soldiers went about guarding his tomb. Pilate says this in Matthew 27, verses 65 and 66. It says, the high priest tore his clothes and said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in Matthew 26. I need to flip over one chapter to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, starting in verse 65, says this. After they had complained that, you know what, Jesus said he was going to rise again. They said, Pilate gave them permission, take a guard. Go, make the tomb, and this is the phrase I love, as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. <laughs> they made the tomb as secure as they knew how. But here's the thing, they were trying to keep people from breaking in. Nobody was going to break in, somebody was breaking out. Right? And it didn't matter how secure they made that tomb, Jesus was breaking out. Okay? You don't put him in solitary confinement of the tomb. You can put him in Alcatraz or whatever you would think would be the most secure place you could put someone. Jesus was busting out of the grave. And here's the reason it was part of God's divine plan. You can't go against God's divine plan. In God's divine plan, Jesus was going to go to the cross. In God's divine plan, he was going to be placed in the tomb. And then in God's divine plan, on the third day, he was coming out of the tomb. And I don't care how secure they made it, make it as secure as you know how. All right, well, we sealed it. We've got this big stone in front of it. We've sealed the stone, and we've posted a guard. Every four hours, we're changing our shifts so that nobody becomes so tired that they won't Keep their guard. We've got this. But they didn't got that. It's good English, by the way. I hope all you children in here are paying attention. Use that in a sentence this week. They don't got that. That won't work so well for you, by the way. Jesus was coming out. So, yeah, they tried to make the tomb secure, but... Jesus was coming out, people weren't going in, except for once it was open to see that he wasn't there anymore. And again, it was against God's divine plan for him to stay in the tomb. I want to look at Luke 24, 
And we're going to read the resurrection account. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse number 1. We read this, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared, and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Do you see the two things there? They found the stone rolled away. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, verse 4 Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? And here's what Jesus said, verse 7, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He must be crucified, but then on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. I need you to see a few things from that this morning. The word of Jesus can always be trusted. The disciples didn't understand this. Wait, what? You've been leading us for three years You've been talking about this kingdom, like we're ready for the kingdom, but he had a kingdom that was not of this world. He will set up his earthly kingdom one day. But what he was talking about was an eternal kingdom that everyone who placed their faith in him would be a part of. The disciples are wondering, wait a second, you're telling me you need to be taken into Jerusalem, you need to be arrested, you need to be insulted, you need to to be placed on, on the cross, you need to die. They didn't understand this, and they certainly didn't understand that he was going to be raised to life three days later. The passage that I talked about earlier in Matthew, whenever they said, hey, let's make this tomb secure as possible, in that thing, in that passage, in, in Matthew 27... The soldiers, the religious leaders, they all knew what Jesus had said, but nobody really understood what Jesus was saying. Oh, it must just be a trick. No, it's no trick. Jesus really was coming back to life, and that's why the angels say, hey, don't you remember what he said? Now, here's what I need to remind you that he said. In John chapter 14, do you know what Jesus said? He said, I am the way. The truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. That statement of Jesus is every bit as true as the statement Jesus made that said, and three days later I must be raised to life again. Eternal life is found only through Jesus. That's what he said. They remembered his words, verse 8 said. They, they eventually remembered They needed to be reminded, but they did remember. And maybe you need reminded of something that you heard long, long ago. Maybe you were just a child in Sunday school when your parents or your grandparents took you to to church. And you remember hearing about Jesus. And you remember maybe your Sunday school teacher telling you, you needed Jesus as your Savior. But now you're 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years removed from that. And to some degree, you've forgotten a lot of what you were told. Maybe it just became old hat to you. Maybe it just became something that you intellectually knew, but you never applied to your life. And you're hearing it again today. Jesus is the only way. You need Jesus as your Savior. Will you trust Him today? The the story, the account continues on in verse number 9 of Luke 24. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. And to all the others, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Now listen to the very next verse. But they, talking about the apostles, did not believe the women. All right, They had heard Jesus say this was going to happen. The women saw that it had happened. They had even talked to angels who had reminded them, here's what was going to happen and did happen. And they still didn't believe. If you've had a hard time believing, just know you're in good company. 
But you need to cross over that threshold because you're going to find that the disciples, they eventually do believe. It says they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. And the resurrection seems like nonsense to a lot of people. But to those of us who believe in the life of Jesus, believe in the death of Jesus, believe that he was buried and that he rose again, these words are words that propel us in this life. They encourage our faith. They strengthen our faith because we know that this is true of Jesus. Peter, verse 12, gets up. He ran to the tomb and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Now there's a beautiful account that takes place right after this. One of my favorite accounts in scriptures, in scripture Jesus being on the road to Emmaus, and I want to read this for you, and I just want you to soak in the beauty of what's taking place here. Verse 13, now that same day, two of them, talking about two of the people who had been in Jerusalem, they were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They're talking with each other about everything that had happened. This was no small event, right? They had released Barabbas. They had cried out, crucify him about Jesus. Everybody knew what was happening. And now we have murmurs and whispers. They say that Jesus rose from the dead. I'm hearing news about it. Like I, I heard it from a reliable source. They're telling me Jesus isn't in the grave anymore. It says as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Oh, man, you want to talk about a day. Jesus comes up and he starts walking with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, I'm going to insert one word here. Hey, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, the Bible doesn't say, hey. I just imagine that's probably what Jesus said. He probably walked up, nudged them on the shoulder and said, hey, guys, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> They stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? And do not know the things that have happened in these days? Well, what things? Jesus asked. Well, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had really hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. Imagine Again, this is Jesus, the one whose body they didn't find. He's walking along. They didn't, they didn't find him. They came and they told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And I can imagine, even though it doesn't say this, Jesus is like, really? They say he's alive, huh? Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not see. Huh, really? Okay. So Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, and this might have been the greatest message ever told, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going to go farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. This sounds a little bit almost like the Last Supper, doesn't it? Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? 
Didn't we? Oh, man, we almost got it. We, we almost knew this. It's kind of like the NCAA tournament, right? All of you, after a basketball game happened, oh, I, I, I knew it. I was going to pick them. And I, oh, man, I just knew that upset was going to happen. These guys are like, oh, my goodness, we were walking along. He's explaining things about himself. And we're kind of looking at each other like, wow, this guy's teaching is amazing. Wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. How does he understand all of these things? And they're saying to each other, oh, my goodness, we had Jesus with us all day. And we didn't even realize it. And the moment they realized it, what happened? Jesus left. So then they get up in verse 33. They returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, do you remember how far they went? They went seven miles, right? Do you remember what time they said it was whenever Jesus was saying, hey, I'll go a little farther. They're like, no, it's almost evening. Stay here with us. But after they go in and they break bread together and they realize, oh my goodness, this is Jesus. Jesus disappears. They get up out of their seats and they go seven miles back to Jerusalem because they got to tell somebody. You, you remember when the, the women came back and they said that, that Jesus wasn't there and they, they saw a vision of angels and the, the angels said that Jesus was alive. And you remember like Peter then went and he couldn't find Jesus either. We saw Jesus. This is, I'm not kidding you. This is the honest to goodness truth. Like, we walked with Jesus for seven miles on the road. He explained the entire Old Testament to us, and it made sense. We sat down with him. We started eating together, and all of a sudden, we realized, oh my goodness, we're with Jesus. And then he left. And we had to come back here seven miles. Now listen, I don't imagine that these guys were like marathon runners. I don't imagine that they were like in the greatest shape of their life. But I bet you they booked it back to Jerusalem. Maybe they were making a 10, 15 minute mile, whatever it might be. But they made their way back there and they told the story. Here's the thing that we need to understand. The resurrection of Jesus was not something that was hidden. It was not something that remained a secret. If you flip over in your Bibles, this is going to be the last passage that we look at this morning. We're almost done. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, the beginning part talks about the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it talks about how he appeared to over 500 people all at one time. It talks about how he appeared to the disciples. And then we get down and it talks about the resurrection in verse 12, we find this, and this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, If it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Some of them were arguing, arguing and saying, after life, you cease to exist. There is no resurrection. Well, Paul's argument is, wait a second. If we're preaching that Jesus was raised from the dead, why wouldn't we preach that everyone who trusts in Jesus is also raised to eternal life. It goes on and says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And we know he's been raised. All these people saw him. Even those two guys who walked with him, their eyes were opened and they realized it was Jesus. They ran back to Jerusalem seven miles and they told him they had seen Jesus more than and in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now listen, don't tell me my preaching is useless. It's not useless because there's power in the resurrection. And your faith isn't useless because there's power in the resurrection. There is eternal life that was accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. More than that, verse 15. We are then found to be false witnesses about God because we've all been saying we saw Jesus. We've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. 
If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Verse 20 is so beautiful. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He's been raised from the dead. So our faith isn't futile. Our preaching isn't in vain. There is the hope of eternal life. Some of you in the last year, you have lost someone very dear to you. And you have the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Some of you maybe are facing friends, loved ones who are battling an illness even right now. And I would say to you, the most important conversation you could ever have with your friend or with your loved one who is facing the reality of eternity, maybe sooner than what they ever would have expected in life, the most important conversation you could ever have with them is this. Do you know Jesus is your Savior? I'm not asking you if you grew up going to church. I'm also not asking you if you just believe that there's a God. I'm asking you, have you ever had a time in your life when you prayed and you said, Jesus, I, I know I'm a sinner. My sin separates me from you. I need you to be my Savior. Because in Jesus, there is hope for eternal life. There is, this is talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4, a time when the dead will be raised to life, when the body and the soul will be reunited. We look forward to that time, the hope that we have in Jesus. This morning as we celebrate the resurrection, I want to give you just two challenges, maybe three. You know how I am. The first challenge is this. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, don't wait another second. We've been here one hour and two minutes. It took three hours for the thief on the cross, but your time to hear this message is just about up. That thief on the cross, he started out one way, hurling insults. And I don't care if you came in here and for the last 25 years, you've been telling your family how stupid it is that they wake up and they go to church. I don't care if you have rejected him for 73 years of your life. I don't care what has taken place in your past. You are like the thief on the cross. It's time for you to change your mind. It's time for you to humble yourself and say, regardless of what has happened in the past, I believe in Jesus And I'm going to trust him right now to save me from my sin. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is to everyone who's already a child of God. You believe in the resurrection, amen? Amen. Since you believe in the resurrection, you believe that there is an eternity, amen? amen? And since you believe in eternity, you have to believe that your friends and your loved ones are going to go one place or the other. They're either going to be with Jesus in heaven or they're going to be separated from him in hell. Push yourself to have that conversation with them, regardless of how difficult or challenging it may be. They need Jesus. Meeting and being with Jesus changes one's eternity. So this morning, if you don't know him, I'm going to ask you right now to bow your head. Everybody, just bow your head right now. I'm going to ask you this question. Have you ever asked Jesus to be your Savior? If you haven't, I want you to pray something like this. If you, if, you, if you realize Jesus did die, he really did get placed in a tomb. He really did raise to life again. And you say, I believe he did that to rescue me from my sin. I want you to pray these words. I want you to pray, dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you came I believe you lived a sinless life. I believe you went to the cross. And I believe you were placed in the tomb. But Jesus, I believe you were raised to life. And as we just read, I believe you can offer me eternal life. So right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And I ask you to rescue me and be my Savior. I trust in you. If you did that... I want to rejoice with you. If you've already done that, if you came in here already being a child of God, we want to rejoice with you as well. This isn't the end of the journey. You can go ahead and look up at me here for a moment. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I have a little booklet I want to give you on the way out. It talks about your new life in Christ. It talks about things that will help you grow in your faith. Because coming to know Jesus and becoming a child of God is not the end of a journey, it's the beginning of the journey. Jesus broke out of the grave to offer eternal life and abundant life to all who would believe. 
And we want to help you on that journey. If you're already a child of God, I want to encourage you, or just became a child of God, I want to encourage you to share the good news. That's what it's about. It's not about like keeping it to ourselves. We want to share it with others. Just as those women, they ran back and told the, the disciples. The disciples didn't believe right away. They ran to the tomb. Peter did and a couple others checked it out. Then they went. Then these guys the road to Emmaus. They find out, oh my goodness, Jesus is alive. They run all the way back to Jerusalem. They tell people. The natural result of coming to know Jesus is telling others about what he's done in your life. So I want to encourage you to do that. We're going to stand. We're going to sing together. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. I know I made the, the transition a little bit difficult. Go ahead and let's stand together. If you haven't yet trusted Jesus as your Savior, you still have some questions. I'm going to walk to the very back. I'm going to be right be, beside the sound booth. I'd love to meet you back there to answer your questions, to pray with you, and to give you the opportunity to know Jesus as your Savior as well. Don't leave today not having the power of the resurrection in your life. You need Jesus. They needed Jesus. I needed Jesus. We all need Jesus. Let this one hour and six minutes make a change for your eternity. Let's sing together.